Hello, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to Berlin Buzzwords. My name's Charlie Hull. Um, I'm from Open Source Connections, uh, where the search and relevance people, and we're sponsoring Berlin Buzzwords. Very happy to do that. Do check out our uh, partner, our booth in the partner area. So this talk actually is presented by the Haystack Conference, who are partnering with Buzzwords this year. Um, with Haystack, we aim to share great talks on search and relevance and bring the community together. Um, currently, we're running a Haystack Live Meetup every few weeks. I'll drop a link into the chat. Uh, you're very welcome to join that. We've got nearly 800 people coming along to those talks. And later this year, we're evening hoping, hoping to start running physical events again. Fingers crossed. Uh, do keep an eye on the Haystack website, and I'll paste a link to that into the chat as well. But anyway, back to tonight's uh, Ask Me Anything. So, vector search, it's the next big thing in search, right? Well, how do you actually do vector search? Why should you consider using it? Does it work? How does it work? Is it fast? Is it slow? Might it be better than good old text search with TFITF? Uh, what are the pros and cons? Is it even ready for mainstream use yet? Well, I'm very happy to say to help answer some of these questions, we have two luminaries of the search world. We have Dimitri Khan of Silo AI and my colleague Max Irwin uh, from uh, Open Source Connections, who are going to try and answer these questions. Uh, Dimitri and Max, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves and also maybe a quick uh, story about how you got so interested in this topic. So, Dimitri, maybe, maybe you can kick us off. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. Uh, so, yes, I'm Dimitri Khan, go by Dima for short. I'm currently a principal AI scientist with Silo AI. It's the largest private AI lab in the Nordics. And I'm currently leading a team of AI scientists and search engineers building new experiences for web scale search. Uh, so how did I end up in this topic of vector search? It has been a hobby topic for me since August last year. Well, apparently there was nothing better to do. <laughs> And uh, from the first experiment, I have set out to evaluate vector search from the feasibility and production readiness point of view. And uh, it turned out that both solar and elastic search support vector search. Well, technically for solar, I had to take a custom query plugin into use. And for elastic search, I came across elastic and then implementation. And another goal um, of mine was to publish my findings uh, on Medium. And this helped me to attract attention from the larger community, uh, leading to testing a commercial implementation of vector search on custom APU boards. Um, and according to my most recent experiment, um, you know, this custom solution was the best. Um, and the second best was um, Elasticsearch. Uh, so I'm continuing my experimentation in this area. It's, it's really, really interesting topic for me. Fantastic. Thanks, Dima. Uh, Max? Hey, everybody. I'm Max Irwin. I'm a managing consultant at Open Source Connections. Uh, I've been working in the search domain for about 10 years now, maybe a little bit longer. I started learning and using NLP in 2015. My uh, initial area of research was actually knowledge graph extraction and uh, vocabulary extraction. Um, and I still tinker there occasionally, but <clears throat> I fell into the natural progression of NLP into uh, large language models, the, the BERT stuff, uh, in the past three years. Uh, these days, I'm, I'm actively working on working with clients and trying to bring these models and merge them with the practical tools that we use day to day in search technology. Uh, I'm also writing a couple chapters for the book AI Powered Search by Trey Granger with Doug Turnbull. My chapters are about using large language models with vector search for autocomplete semantic search and question answering. Uh, I'm focused specifically, again, on practical tooling and use and the use cases for practitioners and trying to bring all this cool stuff that happens in ivy, ivory towers of academia and Google and Bing into the hands of just us regular folks who are trying to ship, ship smaller products day to day. Fantastic. Thanks, Max. So the way this is going to work, um, you can submit questions on vector search for Dimitri and Max uh, in the in the usual fashion in the chat, 
Um, but we also, we thought we'd uh, get ahead of the, ourselves a little, and we asked the community uh, a couple of weeks ago to send us some questions to get us kicked off and uh, maybe to inspire some of your questions. So we're going to start with those. Um, hopefully this uh, this will be useful. Uh, so we're going to kick off with our first question. And uh, forgive me, I, I may have to read this from the uh, document because it's complicated. Uh, our first question, um, and I'm sorry, we don't have uh, the people who ask these questions written down here, but maybe you'll recognize them yourself. Um, a lot of uh, machine learning applications use the uh, face, suffice, NOI, or NMS lib behind a simple web service for uh, approximate nearest neighbor retrieval, uh, for example, in a recommender systems. This works well for simple applications, but when efficient filtering is required, it seems you need to, need to take the leap to a fully fledged search system, Elasticsearch, Vesper, et cetera. Do you think there's an unserviced niche for a face or face plus filter tool? Or do you think the additional benefits of a search system like Vesper pays for the additional complexity it brings? I'm gonna ask this, this to, to Dima. Oh yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, well, if you are in the elastic search world as I am, uh, you have two options. So um, I already mentioned the Elastic uh, NN plugin. Uh, it basically implements an LSH um, locality sensitive hashing algorithm. And then if you wanna live dangerously, you can also go and check out Open Distro and um, they implement like a graph method. Um, and it's basically like off heap. Uh, so it builds like, uh, it's, it's implemented in C++. And, um, Elastic and then plugin supports pre-filtering. So you can, it's, 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 a, it's a typical use case, I would say in many search engines, when you have a number of, you know, parameters that you want to filter your search down first, and then you will run an A and N algorithm on top of that. Um, I'd say whichever methods you choose, you need to carefully select the hyperparameters uh, that each of these algorithms, um, you know, offer. Um, in order to bring the best, uh, you know, performance in terms of indexing speed versus recall versus like memory consumed during indexing and during search. And I'd say, um, at least according to the papers, um, you know, the, the graph method, the hierarchical navigable small world graph method scales well to uh, multi-core architectures. And it has like a bunch of heuristics there as well to avoid like local minima when it builds the graph and it builds a well-connected graph as well for like really large set of nodes. Um, but you know, like if you go back to Lucene, building a graph for each segment uh, might become super expensive. And so you should consider merging segments down into one segment before uh, serving queries. Um, and so generally I think combining filtering with an ANN in one single, you know, pass is is a wise decision because you know if you offer like a multi-step retrieval where you will like first retrieve something then filter down and then you know re-rank uh, this will this will likely suffer from low speed or low recall or both so so i think combining this into one single phase is really nice and and, and wise solution max what do you think uh i think that um Yes to both. I think there's a there is a openness for a niche in the face plus filter, um, and I uh, but I think that there are you know huge things that Elasticsearch and Vespa, for example, bring to the table. So if you're gonna if you're gonna build something on top of, for example, NMS Lib or, or Face or another vector search uh, library, you're you're basically doing the same thing as if you were going to start building a search engine off of Lucene. You can do it, but you're going to miss out on all the things that we take for granted with DevOps and configurability and deployment and sharding, replication and all that stuff. Um, so you probably shouldn't roll your own uh, like that and chuck it into production. You're going to have a, a very, very hard time with that. Um, Dima already mentioned, you know, the stuff that Elastic is working on in some areas there. Um, there are some new players that are coming out, uh, like Gina AI, VV8, Milvis, Pinecone are a couple uh, examples that are trying to fill that niche. Um, but those are, you know, the, the, they're newer, they're, they're startups, they're, uh, they're, it, is, it is risky if you want to build some, you know, an existing big product on top of one of those newer systems. 
Um, you can check out Vespa, which is uh, definitely the mature product in this space. But I think there are a lot of a lot of options you can look at and consider. But definitely do the research and, and make an informed decision. Fantastic. I will mention, actually, we've had a couple of these vector search engines uh, presenting at Haystack Live. Uh, so you can go back and check those out. They're on our YouTube channel. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, sometimes information is encoded in the language people use. I mean, layman's terms for layman's content or professional terms for professional content. So in medicine, you might have very different results for acute myocardial infarction and heart attack. How do you model these differences as input for a language model? Um, but all our vectors are not the answer here for where there are domains where there's information uh, in the meaning, um, but also in the terms. Uh, Max, do you want to kick us off on this one? Yeah, so this is this is the classic NLP vocabulary mismatch problem, but not even, not even NLP, just the search vocabulary mismatch problem. You have a corpus of text that contains one uh, one type of language, and then you have people searching using a different type of language. Um, there, are, there are a couple things here. So first of all, with, with vector search, you know, it's not like this magic thing that you're just going to throw it out there and replace everything that you're doing. You know, you, there are a lot of tools that you can use that we've been using for years. Um, and traditionally, this has been solved with synonyms and, and knowledge graphs, right? So you can, you can do a map. So if you see a term that's not in your corpus, you can map to the to the language that's in your in your corpus and in your index, um, there are in terms of bringing this stuff into large language models, you can try some hacks of you know fine tuning by adding additional content to your model that contains uh, the language that you want to include. But no matter what, the the, the large language model was was trained on an initial vocabulary. Um, and that vocabulary is limited. So in, in BERT, you have like word pieces, and the word pieces are like 30,000 um, initial word pieces. So if, if your language deviates from that significantly, then even fine tuning may not really help that much. Um, and you can try training your own model and setting your own vocabulary with a merged uh, vocab set and merged content set. Um, but that's you know, expensive and typically out of the reach for most teams. Um, but you know, if, if you have the resources, uh, you know you can you can try that and, and and you know as a hypothesis and test and see how it plays out. Dima, what's your view on this one? Yeah, um, I think it's kind of cool when you throw like a um, bird model, for instance, at search, and you type mathematics, and it tells you you know geometry or linear algebra in response. It's kind of all cool and fancy. But I think when it comes, you know, to a specific domain, you know, like financial or healthcare, whatever you have, I don't think it will capture it so easily. And so I agree with Max there, like you, you really need to fine tune your model uh, on the data, which might be super expensive as well, depending on the size of your corpora. Uh, but at the same time, do you really want to go and attack that problem from, from the, you know, large scale model? Or do you want to just go and configure that old-fashioned dictionary which will work quite well because it's a controlled way you know to offer this experience to your users and and why why to pay so much uh you know money to train a model when you don't see an exact application for it and um yeah i mean i think we'll, we will also cover some topics in the future during today but like also establish a baseline for your search like know how how it performs now before you venture into into vector model, very sensible. Uh, find try the stuff that uh, you know works before you try the stuff that you don't know if it works. Um, so our next question: um, Somebody's noticed that uh, Instagram music uses some kind of language model now, and if you search for "capitaine," the French word for captain, to find French songs that are called "capitaine," uh, English songs about captains are actually not relevant. How do we avoid losing the information contained in the exact words when we search with, with meaning, as you might have with a vector model? Dimitri. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, as a matter of fact, I, I, I'm building uh, with my team like a multilingual uh, search engine. And um, we basically have like independent indices for different languages. And so when query comes in, we do our best to detect a language. And so then we will like 
send the query into the specific um, index. So there is like a high likelihood that it will capture uh, the semantics of what you need, even, even like without vector search. Um, but other than that, I think if you if you already implemented like vector search, give users control in the in in your user interface. Like if they if do, if they don't agree with the results and they clearly see that search engine didn't nail it, you know, just give them tools to go back to like old fashioned lexical uh, search with with exact match. So that's what I would recommend. And I guess you could also uh, try some things like language detection. Um, yeah. Max, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, the important lesson is that uh, don't don't just throw away your existing search stack um, and uh, replace it with with vector search right away. You know, it's 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 another uh, it's another feature that you would use. Um, so when somebody and, and and it's it's important to take a step back and think of the the problems that you're users have, the information needs that your users have. So if somebody approaches your search bar and they search for something in quotes or they're looking for an exact term, give, the, give them what, what they want. You know, people have been trained on keyword search since like the early 90s. So <laughs> you, there's a lot of cultural, uh, cultural stuff that's embedded in just searching for nouns and not providing any other language. So when, when that happens, don't don't throw out the ability to do the exact match, um, and you know do additional things. You know use use diversity of search results. You know do some federation maybe um, do some stuff to bring in other things. So you get both the best of both worlds. You get the exact matching um, where people have very very fine control over what they're retrieving, um, and then you also get that that juicy semantic meaning. Uh, relationship from vector search, um, and and combine the two for uh, for a better experience. Fantastic. So um, while we're um, uh, asking these pre pre canned questions, uh, do remember to submit your own questions using the uh, the questions tab on the right of this presentation as you're watching us, and we'll uh, ask our experts here. Um, I've got a, a a quick question here. I'm going to answer myself actually. Somebody said uh, they have experience of search and keyword search and building taxonomies, and they find it hard to work in these fields. Um, I will recommend uh, relevant Slack, which uh, I'll drop a link into the chat. Um, and there's a jobs channel there. So if you want to do that, and maybe go on to working in some of the more advanced fields like vector search, that's a good place to start. So our next submitted question, um, I'll have to read this one quickly, uh, carefully because it's complicated. Um, so we see some patterns that have emerged in the space of dense retrieval, uh, both from the research side as well in the industry. What are your thoughts on what's coming next in dense retrieval? Where are things heading and what will people need to do to prepare? Uh, Dima, do you want to start us on this one? Oh yeah, for sure. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I think there is like a lot of development going on in this area. So I would um, dearly recommend you the beer paper if you haven't read it yet. I'll try to share the link later, but it's 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 a, it's an excellent uh, benchmark, you know, where they compare you know dense methods against re-ranking methods against lexical uh, matching using TF idea for BM25, and um, you know then you can like this paper establishes like the baseline of understanding what's going on in this area. Um, and then uh, there have been like some really uh, cool uh, papers recently, for instance, training uh, embedding model like on byte level. So this helps you to, um, you know, solve some daunting issues with misspelling and, and, and other related problems. And then another paper applies Fourier transform to improve, you know, the speed of BERT. And, and it basically became seven, seven times faster with like 92 percent accuracy so i'd say the community is moving ahead on solving this like various issues um with the embeddings because um these players actually do use them in production so in 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 the client that i'm working for right now uh we are using uh like uh, a dense method i will not name it uh but um it basically gives really uh, good results on dcg um and another thing from this beer paper is that, um, you know, like 
dense dense retrieval methods will not generalize well so like they will beat like bm25 only when the model was um trained on 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 the same domain as the queries um and also what's interesting and important to understand is like when you apply vector search in your domain uh depending on the size of the documents you need to pick uh the similarity metric very carefully because for instance cosine uh similarity will favor shorter documents while dot product will favor you know longer documents so maybe you need to have some kind of combination of this you know uh, metrics or like a dynamic selection of the metric depending on the use case or the the query intent um and also like performance of vector search at large you know it's an unsolved issue uh so you need to be looking at a bunch of like model configuration parameters that will work best for you uh and sort of like like that's my personal advice pay less attention to the error margins reported by big players because what works for them might not work for you and i will try to share some 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 papers with you later as well so well we're, we're lucky to have uh, joe christian bergham and uh, josh devins in the channel and they're uh, they're being our link buddies tonight so thank you guys for posting links to the papers uh so you've got more more reading to do uh max what do you think where are things heading uh, yeah, great, great question. So <clears throat> when this stuff first started showing up, like, you know, three years ago, two, three years ago, um, it was mostly focused on uh, retrieval and, and matching and ranking, you know, for nearest, replacing, not maybe not replacing, but using uh, approximate nearest neighbor instead of BM25 as your, uh, as your matching and ranking uh, signals. I think that what we've seen recently and the things that you really should prepare yourselves for are how it's this technology and these techniques uh, with vector search are being used for the entire search experience. So it's autocomplete, it's uh, spelling, uh, query rewriting, um, it's like snippeting and highlighting, you know, question answering, um, recommendations, personalization, classification and enrichment, like all of these aspects that we think about in, in a full search experience, we're, we're seeing, um, we see that Google and Bing are now using these day to day. You can do a, a web search on either of those engines or any of the engines that use Bing, uh, for example. Well, if you look at the page rendered, you can, you can tell that it's using this technology. Um, and the way it always follows with this technology is you pay attention what the, to what the people with the billions of dollars are doing, and sooner or later it's going to fold into into the little fish, uh, you know, the folks like us that are trying to do the day to day stuff. Um, so I recommend that you focus on the fundamentals of how these technologies work. Read uh, read the papers, and if you don't understand the papers or the math, that's fine. Um, get involved with the community, play around with. The hugging face uh, stuff. Try out some collab notebooks that people have published, just to get a feel of you know how how this technology works, and then apply it to apply it to your own problems and explore you know and tinker uh, and and see what's possible and see see the problems that you run into. Um, just keep yourself fresh with experience because that's you know that's how we learn and that's how we go forward with with all these new technologies. And anytime something comes up. You just got to keep playing with it. And the state of the art, the soda world, we're, we'll just keep pushing forward and the community will just keep pushing forward. Just, you know, follow what's going on, um, follow the community and, and see what interests you and, and learn where, where you feel you have gaps. Thanks, Max. So we've got a question actually submitted uh, online. I'm going to, to, to uh, wedge it in here uh, while we work through our pre uh, our pre can questions. Um, so I, I Somebody asks, um, isn't the aforementioned pre-filtering counterintuitive, at least for e-commerce? Cannot know, We cannot know beforehand for unregistered customers whether they want to filter by color or price range. Now, do we know what that refers to in our previous conversation? Um, I might need a bit more color there, but... I think um, it probably refers to our... Uh, I think the when we were talking mm -hmm. about um, doing pre-filtering um, maybe for language, I guess, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure. 
Yeah, I guess if I understand the question right, is that um, uh, if, if we apply, let's say we, we choose between, let's say price and size, right? So we have two filters in the search engine. Now we have an option just to run the vector search on everything. And then basically, you know, uh, do some post filtering or, or smart ranking and, and, and maybe show two groups of results, you know, by size and, and, and by, by color, whatever it is. Um, but the way I see, the way I look at it is that you will be also bound by, by speed of light. So like when, when you execute, execute a vector search, right? You, you will face uh, performance issues. There will be like a bottleneck. Like if you look at, at my blog post, um, I, will, I will share the link as well, sorry. I don't have access to the chat right now, but the thing is that uh, it's, it's quite expensive. It's super expensive. It's like more than a second uh, what it takes to run one single search. So you do want to pre-filter you know the space basically you are entering a new space of your documents right and now you you run your vector search with some similarity metric and you are sort of like searching in that local subspace of your documents is it good experience or not it's up to your uh, ux it's up to what you are delivering uh, in the product uh so uh, maybe still offer the tools to the user if user disagrees you know with the results and you have some hints there that hey we applied some method that maybe we think it's the best but here are the tools if you disagree go and filter out yourself or maybe don't filter so that that would be my answer right i hope that answers your question i'm, I'm gonna skip on to one of our uh, our previous questions here because uh, i think that this might cover quite a few uh, people's uh, requests but Content length is an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, because obviously, you know, we know in in text matching, content length can affect you know the weighting of the various uh, fields we use in our in our ranking formulae. But uh, where is there a content length sweet spot where dense vectors have a clear advantage over sparse vectors? Plain TFIDF. Max. <laughs> uh, no, there 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 is and there isn't. Um, so if you look, at, you know, if you're getting embeddings for text. If you look at the model, you know, the model will be limited by, you know, you'll have some limitation on the number of tokens that you can pass into the model at, at, in one step. Um, and so that that's an upfront limitation of the model and, archi and uh, architecture that you choose. Um, there are a lot of efforts now to remove that barrier to, to make things longer and longer. Um, I would I would ask the question you know assuming that that there were some uh, if there wasn't any limit uh, ask yourself the same question just with BM twenty five how would how would you do this like and I think in a lot of cases it's important to not not just generalize but take a step back and look at the problem like what does it mean to have a relevant document and a relevant piece of information right we there was a my my colleague. Um, Bertrand, you know, he, he asked a question, you know, he had a client that was trying to uh, index a document that was hundreds of megabytes. And, uh, and you know, you're wondering, well, what, is, what does that mean to have a relevant hit on a document that's hundreds of megabytes in length? You know, you, that could be, you can contain like a lot of Wikipedia in that, you know, that's, that's so much knowledge. So there's this idea of, well, how do you carve up the text for what you want for your domain and your customers' needs? Where do, you, where do you draw the line? Are people looking for a specific answer? Are they looking for a passage? Are they looking for entire books um, or chapters? Uh, and that varies from need to need, even, the, you know, even, even in the domain. You, know, you might have situations where you say, okay, I'm gonna give you the whole thing back or I'm just gonna give you this one snippet. So uh, in terms of the technology limitation, um, that exists, but even even then, like understand how you're cutting stuff up and how you want to surface relevant relevant data. And you know, vector search there is kind of the ap the afterthought. It's like, okay, well, I have this similarity function, um, and I'm just going to apply that and get a score uh, to to the texts that I have. What do you think, Dima? Do you think there's a sweet spot where it, on, on content length? Uh, I think if there is a sweet spot, it's definitely before 512 word pieces because all neural, you know, approaches has the, have this limit, and maybe eventually this will be lifted. But at this point, 
if you if you read the paper that I mentioned, they actually they actually mentioned this limitation there. Um, but the question is again, like, do you even need that much? Um, you know, like if you take a really long document, like Max ex explained just now, I, I think if it has like a, a really diverse set set of like topics in it, like if you have like thousands of pages in that document, it's like a copy paste from Wikipedia or something. Uh, you know, imagine clustering this, you know, let's say you are using uh, the graph method and in the graph method, you will have like this really big, you know, hot, hot spots. And then this document will be like connected to a bunch of other documents. And does it help your user? I'm not sure. So what, what I would do is probably try to like dissect your document in a number of like meaningful blocks. So for instance, let's say you have a section which is like about a specific topic or introduction or like whatever the meat part of that document. Um, and then, you know, you could, you could, for instance, go and index those specific sections in a, in a, in a separate field and then use BM25 as your baseline. You don't even need the vector search there, right? Um, then another approach is that you could summarize the document. Then the question is, if, if you have thousands of pages, can you actually summarize that document? I don't think so. Like you, you will probably need a number of summaries and then you could, of course, encode that those as vectors using like whatever bird like model or whatever you, you would like. Um, so I, I would say like step back from, from like thinking, is it vector search that's going to solve all, my, all, all of my problems? Is it BM25? Is it some, some uh, not invented yet method? And think about what is in your data. Like ask your domain experts to annotate those documents so you actually have those building blocks uh, at, at your hands and, and you can go and like, you know, experiment with different methods and have some sensible baseline. I think BM25 is a proven proven baseline at the moment. And so, you know, play off of that. That, that I think would be my recommendation here. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna just uh, flip to a question from the audience. Uh, we've got, it's been, it's been highly voted. And uh, somebody has asked, how does hit highlighting work in a vector search world? Max, do you wanna take that one? Oh, that's a great question. So um, the way hit highlighting works is, uh, so you, you have a, a large language model and it's pre-trained. Uh, you have a pre-trained model. Um, the, I, I, I'll, I'll talk specifically about the question answering um, aspect of this because this is a form of hit highlighting uh, for closed domain question answering. There's, there's open domain question answering, but this is the tech that, technique that, I, that I'm using for question answering. Um, is you have a, a fine-tuning task um, where you have the passage, uh, the query, and the thing that you want to highlight, right? Uh, so those three things is what you need for, for training and test data to, to fine-tune your model. So it, it will learn in the fine-tuning task, given this passage and given this query, you know, what what should I, what's the word or words that I should uh, present um, and highlight? Um, and it doesn't make up text. It, it, it always, it's, it's, it basically gives you positioning, um, which works very similar to highlighting, right? So you fine tune this model on, um, on your task, uh, on your data, and then you have the model. And then when you are using this thing in production, um, you get your search results back uh, from ANN or BM25 or whatever, and you pass in the passages uh, that come back in your results into this other model, and then it returns the positioning for you, and then you can use highlighting there. Or you could just call it out, and you don't have to highlight it in place. You can just say, here's your answer, right? So that's, that's pretty much uh, how it works. Um, I'm trying to remember. There's a specific data set uh, that's available um, that it, it's a, it's a, it starts with an S, but it's escaping me right now because I'm having a brain freeze while I'm trying to talk and answer questions. Uh, but if, if, when I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll chuck it into the chat in the, in the breakout session. Great. Dima, what do you think? It's highlighting. Yeah, I think it's... Um... It's kind of challenging because um, if you if you sort of like um, 
if you're just entering this area, let's say you, as I gave you an example, very simple, right? You, you type mathematics and it gives you like linear algebra. Like, can you go and highlight linear algebra having mathematics? No. So you need to have some way of knowing the distance, right? So like, okay, between um, mathematics and linear algebra, there is like the smallest distance and the model should tell you that. So it, it like you could, you could apply like a layer in the, in the model, let's say, let's say attention layer and then see, okay, which of these words correlate best with the query, right? And this is what, what I think Max um, alluded to as well. So let's say, you know, a document is returned and there are like a number of passages there that highly correlate, you know, with the query. So you can go and highlight them. But the question is, should you highlight the whole passage or can you actually build a method that will actually highlight individual most prominent words that contribute to, to answering your question? And this is what highlighters usually do, right? When you go to Google and you type something, it actually highlights you the, the actual you know words to pay attention to and i think you can you can apply like an attention layer again i would need to go and double check that but but this is it, this is the direction in which i would go um as well and i think there are some other methods somebody mentioned to me like um you know uh, decrypting the the vectors back to words and then trying to see the overlap but i'm not sure if it's like shooting uh, from a cannon <laughs> uh, but uh, i think attention layer might might work better so yeah I did remember the name of the data set. It's a uh, squad is the, oh, is yeah. the task. Um, one of our link buddies has already posted that in the chat. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin. Uh, so uh, we've got our, um, let, let's uh, have a look at one of our, our set questions again. Um, and this is an interesting one. What are good and bad use cases for vector search? And, um, Dima, do you want to start us with that one? Sure. Um, this is actually an interesting question because I was thinking like in principle, you can represent any object as a vector. Um, the question is, do you have a, a good model to, to do that? You know, you could in principle take, well, it's known that you can take image, you can take uh, sound, text, um, maybe even like a virus signature, right? If you're like in the, into antivirus world, um, then um, I still think that it's important to pick the right um, similarity metric because uh, you know for different objects um, uh, they will have different like structure in the vector. Like let's say it's a dense vector, or like you have a sift uh, data structure, um, they will have different characteristics, and so. Again, if you read that bigger paper, you will see that different, you know, models uh, will generalize or not generalize, so you'll have to retrain it to that specific object. And so I think in general, you know, vector search has like a really wide applicability area. And probably that's why we see so many new interesting uh, startups um, and open source projects in this, in this field. Um, but when it comes to like implementing sort of coming to the bad side like if you if you throw like uh, some dense vector approach uh, to all of your queries <laughs> probably you may end up in a situation that users will be like scratching their head and thinking what's going on here like I i'm looking for this specific thing and it and it's telling me about some similar thing that i'm not interested in i'm, I'm interested in that specific thing and so this is again the great point to step back and think about establishing the baseline for your search engine. Um, I happen to uh, be a committer at Cupid. Uh, and so great tool, open source, use it uh, or use some other tool to establish the baseline. You know, uh, I'm doing it with my team uh, currently with a number of, uh, for a number of languages. And you will learn a ton from, from establishing the baseline. Trust me, like ranging from uh, hey, you have some problems in the uh, formatting of the document, you know, to source uh, authority or, you know, um, freshness of some of the documents and so on. So uh, work with your domain experts there uh, and then consider any of the, um, you know, ranking um, methods like even LTR, learning to rank as a black box. Okay, I have the baseline. Now I can go and apply 
uh, you know, different methods one by one and see which one wins. And so what other team is doing in our company is that they systematically train uh, dance retrieval methods, tune some parameters, and they have the leaderboard of all of those um, with respect to a specific score like DCG on, and DCG. And then they also can compute the same metrics on their rival, um, you know, on their rivals. And, and, and then that's like a, a sweet spot where you want to be. Max, what do you think on this one? Good or bad for use cases for vector search? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll tell you the, the the biggest leap that I think most people are going to have to make into vector search mentally is that, you know, if you come from an inverted index, you're very used to a certain way of thinking where you have uh, you have your index of a set number of terms, and maybe you have some synonyms, and then you basically do a match and a lookup in that index directly, and then you use BM25 for similarity scoring. With approximate nearest neighbor searching uh, and vector searching, it's kind of like this leap into there's this one step that you do for both. It's like you get stuff back that matches, and then there's a score behind it all at, all at once, right? Um, so that's, I, I think that if you get over that, that first hump of switching your brain into that, I think a lot of the use cases, uh, good or bad, may come naturally when you're thinking about how to apply this into your domain. And I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't really tell your brain how to make that switch. It, it comes with a lot of playing around and, 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 and learning and, and figuring it out. Um, but I'll, I'll give you some do's and don'ts uh, instead of uh, you know, good and bad use cases, because I think there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can try and do, and, and you may, it may end up successful. Uh, it's really hard to answer that generally. So I'll, I'll say like some, some don'ts is, you know, when you have vectors that come from multiple passages, don't try to just average them together because, uh, you you know, to try to increase performance or reduce the space and costs that you have. that That's not going to work. Um, don't try to do that stuff. Uh, don't use a pre-trained model without first understanding what it was trained on uh, and, and the vocabulary that it contains and then also its limitations compared to your domain. Don't just, like, pick a random pre-trained model and be like, oh, this is what they used in this notebook. I'm going to use this one, right? Under understand the model that you're choosing and, and, and using and then and then fine tune it. Um, and don't, don't just use vector similarity as your only feature for ranking. You know, you have a lot of stuff that you can use. You know, we talk about uh, search, you know, when, when you're surfacing results, you don't just use BM25. You use BM25 and you have function scores for like, oh, the recency of the date, uh, you know, the, the rating on the product and, you know, all kinds of other features that combine to make up total relevance. Uh, for a document when when somebody's searching for an information need. Um, so that's some stuff into into uh, some dotes. Some do's is like, do split up your documents into good passages uh, in the size that fits your architecture, your domain, your use cases. Um, and then, you know, you can investigate. Instead of averaging, you can look at things like distillation, uh, summarization, uh, PCA, other, other techniques, quant uh, quantization, to try to get the performance uh, there, because you can't just dump raw vectors right now into your index for entire documents. You, you just your compute and your disk will hate you, um, and your RAM will hate you for that. So you you will have to find a way to get to get there. Um, learn and fine tune the models. I think this is the most probably the most important thing when you are solving a problem for your domain. Um, the use cases for your product will require you to uh, figure out exactly what you want, what your starting point will be, um, and how you tune it for the task at hand. So you may have a, a bunch of a bunch of UK use cases that you want to use this technology for. Um, I mentioned some before, like autocomplete, spelling, query rewriting. You can, you can do a whole bunch of things. So, so understand that these may all require different models and different architectures for your need and different fine tuning tasks. Um, and yeah, use, use this as an additional feature, as an, as an additive 
thing for your experience and your ranking and your retrieval. Um, it's it's going to be it's it's going to be additive. It's not going to be like I'm going to replace the whole thing right now with with vector search. Uh, it's it's another extremely powerful feature uh, for search. Um, and use what you know and have learned uh, already, and, and combine it, and play around with it, and you know, and see how it folds naturally into your stack and into your domain. Thanks, Max. So I'm I'm just going to jump to one of the questions submitted by the audience here. Um, we have a question: What about active learning to improve vector search, meaning tagging the user inputs and then updating or filtering the vectors? What do you think, Timo? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think uh, you can do that. Uh, so there are like, uh, if you if you have dense dense um, retrieval methods, then there, I actually don't remember the method name, uh, but all, everything is in the paper. Um, so one method is that you can combine um, the document with the queries that you know naturally match this this document, and so you will. Um, bubble up the prominence of the of that document during search and so in, in principle i'm thinking why not you can apply an active learning uh you know approach here where you will identify the the relevant uh queries for a specific document you will need to build some system for that i guess you could use cupid i guess um and um <clears throat> so you would go and update the um the document vector with those new queries and so uh, next time around, users are searching with the queries like this. Uh, you will have those documents bubbling up um, to the top, right? So in principle, yes, I think yes, and you should. Actually, in general, I like the idea of, uh, you know, seeing your search engine as an evolving model, as an evolving uh, organism where uh, you should, you should uh, think creatively, like what else can we do to actually establish this pipeline of um, ideas and improvements, because uh, it, it like I, I've seen cases when you know, let's say we apply a specific um, um, vector space model, like in principle BM twenty five, right, and then we just stop looking forward. We just you know we just think okay, everything is in the data, but it's not true. You like you will notice that in the production you will you will see decline in ctr or you will see decline like in what we call exposure which is probably not, not like a common metric used but it's basically how often do we show uh, the results from our search engine so if you see any decline there like take those queries and you know throw them into cupid or some other system where you can investigate them with magnifying glass and then looking at all the ways you can encode additional signal from those from those queries and documents into your model. I hope that answers the the question. But yeah, if, if it doesn't, what do you think, I, Max? Uh, I I uh, totally agree. Um, I I just have one very important point that I think you need to consider when doing active learning is you need to be very careful of bias. Um, and, and thinking about who, as, as a model uh, prompt is presented to you of whether it's good or bad, and then you want to update the model based on your reaction, it's very easy to just kind of quit very quickly, go through it, and, and forget that you are a subjective and biased individual. Um, everybody is in their own way. Um, and if you are taking even uh, crowdsource data uh, from this or, or data from uh, customers or, or users of your product to do active learning there's there's going to be bias there also so there are teams that are really good with this who are used to dealing with this with learning to rank um data sets um but if, if you're new to this and you know and you you're used to kind of capturing judgments at a small scale um try to remember that you probably want to get more than one opinion on things um and you want to understand uh, consensus and disagreement and have discussions about them um, instead of just you as one person like update model update model update model because it's just gonna you're gonna overfit to your own to your own uh, desires and wishes um, and that may drift uh, from what uh, what your users actually want 
maybe I also wanted to add, and this is like a, a topic dear to my heart, try to release more frequently. Because if you if you spend a, a bunch of time thinking about, oh, I have this cool idea, you know, I just need another couple of weeks to, to polish it. By the time you release it, you know, the season might be away and you just will not nail it. And we, we see some interesting use case in our search engine right now when, you know, CTR all of a sudden went down for a specific language, but we, we've done no release. And we are like just figuring out what's going on here, right? So when you start for, from that angle, like and go backwards to your model, like there is like a long path there and, and you can generate a bunch of ideas what you can try. Great, thank you. Okay, so we've got a doozy of a question coming up next uh, from the submitted by the uh, the audience, and I'm I'm wondering who this are that this is. Um, so I'll read this out. It's a long one. In order to make vector search performant, an approximate nearest neighbor approach is typically applied. So Lucene has HMSW, uh, so as Vespa. Given that these A and N techniques essentially partition the vector space into a smaller neighborhood it seems natural to shard large indexes by a and neighborhood so that queries could be routed to specific neighborhoods on specific nodes. And then we can obviously use for performance, neighborhoods with more queries could have more replicas, handle nodes. This will prevent the entire index from being needed to be searched on every query. Could this be useful for enormous indexes such as for an open web search engine? And what are your thoughts now? How feasible this would be to implement with Solar, Vespa, Elastic, et cetera, using HNSW or similar algorithms? So that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, who wants to take that one first? Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take a, a stab at it. So I, I recently reread, well, one, uh, one uh, HNSW paper um, uh, last week. Uh, and I, because I really want to understand how this thing works. And it's one of those things where it's casually offhand mentioned in the paper of, well, this thing is, you can shard this. Um, I don't think using those exact words, but due to the nature of navigable small world and, and neighborhoods, you could effectively uh, shard and split this out uh, and, and then it'll, it'll work. Like that's how it's kind of presented in the paper. Um, but there's no like implementation detail, of course. Uh, so <laughs> I think that, you definitely are going to have to do this. Um, it is it is possible. I don't know the techniques to do it, but uh, and I don't know how Vespa works. I don't know how because uh, Lucene um, Lucene has HNSW, but Solar and Elastic are going to be responsible for the sharding of the Lucene indices. So I think that that's probably a huge barrier to getting this stuff into Solar and Elastic. I don't know if Josh is working on this right now for Elastic. Um, Josh and his team, or uh, I think that Joe Christian might have some comments here about how it works in Vespa, um, but uh, it should be possible, and I think it's going to be absolutely necessary. Uh, and I'm hoping that you know I'm just kind of sitting around waiting for uh, Lucene Nine uh, to ship into Elast into Elastic and Solar, and all this stuff to magically appear. I know that's not going to happen. It requires a lot of hard work from a lot of uh, hardworking people. Um, but I think this is absolutely necessary. Okay. What do you think, Dima? You're working on a, a big search engine? Yes. Uh, actually, think about TFI, DF, and BM25. When you have, let's say, 100 shards and your query comes in, you have some sort of router component which will forward it to independent shards. It will, it will search for the documents, score them, and then return you, let's say, top and from each shard, are these uh, you know, scores compatible? I have a strong conviction that they are not. Why? Because every shard will have their own like term level statistics, um, document length, which is like local to that shard. And, and there are some solutions which you can, for instance, you know, where you can build a global IDF, right? So um, IDF, which will be like, globally updatable, like a distributed cache, whatever. And probably you will run into some race conditions there, I'm pretty sure. But but there are ways to attack it, right? So I think the same, exactly same problem exists in, in our traditional, you know, lovely BM25 search. Now, if you enter into the graph search or into like um, uh, clustered search, 
if you pick that paper, the hierarchical small world, na navigable small world graph, it's so mouthful that I keep, keep reminding myself what's the order of letters there. But that method actually explicitly states in the paper that it's not uh, compatible with the uh, uh, distributed search. And they do mention, you know, like this famous mathem mathematicians from 19th century that proof is obvious and then they die. And then like hundred years after somebody tries to prove that, that, that theorem and then they, you know, die almost as well. So uh, I think, and then they say actually that the previous incarnation of that algorithm, when you remove the age, so it's not hierarchical, it's just a navigable small world graph. That's a perfect match for the distributed search engine. That's what they say. But again, you need to go and check it for yourself. I don't think that you should easily trust everything that's written in papers. You know, <laughs> go and try it for yourself. Yeah, there were a lot of typos in that paper, so that should have you off also. Like. So, so what I'm taking away from this is people in the industry don't always touch, uh, trust people in academia. And also that, uh, that some of these, these areas of maths are effectively cursed and you should uh, navigate them with a great deal of caution because it seems that people die if you get too close. I'm, I'm a bit worried by this. <laughs> Curse mathematics, I love that idea. Okay, well, we've got um, another few minutes. We're actually going to uh, run on a little uh, later than our published end date, end time uh, today because we're the last session of the day. So we're not gonna be jumping into the breakout room. You're welcome to stay with us. We'd love you to stay with us. We're gonna try and get through a few more questions, maybe for an extra 10 minutes at the end of this session. But I must just for completeness mention that at the same time, we have the workshop uh, on digital and ethics running in the machine house. Um, and of course, there's a spatial lounge for um, socializing outside the sessions. But if you're gonna stay with us, we've got some more questions to get through. So let's see what else we have. Um, Let's have a look. We've got, um, well, there's a quick one here. Maybe we can answer quite quickly. How could GPUs be leveraged to improve the vector scoring calculations? And I'm going to ask that to Dima, because I believe you looked at this. Is the GSI um, application you looked at that's using a GPU, isn't it? Yeah, GSI is using, so they've built their own custom uh, APU board. So it's like associative processing unit. So it's not CPU, it's not GPU, it's like something their custom you know, implementation. And um, it's it's particularly friendly with uh, matrix, you know, uh, multiplication and whatnot. So so basically um, the, the, the method, I think, I think they have a, a bunch of like um, uh, weight there with the RAM. So they use a lot of RAM and, and I'm not sure exactly how this board is structured, but basically they can even ship that board to you and you can try it. Um, but basically that was the fastest method that I have seen and, and, and I benchmarked, you know, if you look into my blog post, I think the scale of difference was like 70 milliseconds versus like 1.5 seconds for the vanilla elastic search uh, vector search. So that's like a huge, huge difference. But then again, in order, in order to, to use that method, I had to, um, and, and I'm sure the team is going to iterate on this, but I had to prepare like a, a NumPy array that I would, um, and it took me like four days to, to embed um, one million documents in, into that space and then ship that array. And so they uploaded that. It, it didn't take too long to index and then it was super, super fast. Um, but then again, this is kind of like a hybrid approach uh, to, to, to my sense because you can you can run it on premise. You'll have to pay, right? Uh, but but then, can you actually em emulate something like this without an APU? Uh, and then for the GPUs, I think the the beer paper as well uh, mentioned something. If I if I remember correctly, that you can actually use GPUs to to speed up uh, your search engine for the vector. Yeah. There was a. It, it's funny that this question was asked because I, I haven't tried it yet, but. Two days ago, I, I stumbled across a repo in GitHub uh, called CUHNSW, which has been, you know, it looks like it's a couple months of coding that claims to use CUDA with HNSW. Um, but again, I haven't installed it or played with it. Uh, but it's something to look into if you want to just tinker um, and you have a, an NVIDIA card that's CUDA capable. 
Right. Well, they'll drop their link into the uh, into the chat if you have it. Uh, I don't. Max. I don't have access to the chat. I'll drop it into the into our chat, Charlie, and then you can relay it into. Uh... There we go. I'm, uh, through the magic of copy and paste, I shall put it in for everyone. No, no affiliation. I just found this thing and I started it to say I'm going to look at this later, which we yeah. all know with GitHub stars that never happens. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, if you're really interested, you can go try to install it and see if you can get stuff indexed and in search. Okay. So um, we've got a, a quick question here I'm going to ask about, um, uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure this is vector search related. Um, somebody has asked about seasonality and fine tuning. How can we infer when to update? Uh, maybe a small decrease in click metrics would be enough, or is there a better way for this kind of problem? Uh, Dima, I'm going to ask, does that apply to vector search? Is that referring back to something earlier? Actually, I think it applies to um, embedding at large. Um, I I will try to give you that paper, but I don't remember from the top of my head. Basically, the paper was dealing with seasonality change by, you know, um, basically you can compute like a, a, a stable date range with which you can tag the terms and then you embed them. And so the embedding will also have the term as well as the date the date range, right? And, and then, you know, when you search, for instance, you can also account for like, okay, what, what season I am in, you can definitely know that, which, which date range you fall in, and then you attach that to your term. It almost sounds like payload, payload based search, if you know what I mean, right? So let's say you have a term and then you can add some characteristics to it. And then during the search, you can, you can pre-filter or like filter the terms that fall into the, the specific, um, category set let's say uh part of speech tag or something else that you might encode there so something similar so that paper is really, really interesting i don't know if they have a practical implementation i think the code is on github so if you're interested i i will try to to find that paper and, and post it as well yeah okay um so uh Let's go on to our next question from the audience here. Um, so we talked a bit about ANN coming into uh, Lucene 9. And this is an interesting question. Will this be an easy to use feature when it's exposed in Elasticsearch and Solar? Do you think it'll be easy to use for people once they can access it that, that way? Max, what do you think? Um, I honestly think, you know, the both of the 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 elastic team and the solar community uh, write amazing software right and uh, I think that it will definitely be usable um, and it should be straightforward to use because at, at the heart of it the stuff from from a user perspective uh, isn't really that complicated you know you can go and you can install NMS lib right now and index stuff in Python in like three lines of code, and then you can query it in like a couple lines of code. I think the hard part really is getting the vectors and and understanding what you're matching on. Um, so I think that once once this is available uh, in Solar and Elastic, um, I imagine that it'll be pretty straightforward. It'll probably just be like you know you're going to have a dense vector field, and you're going to specify the analyzer and the similarity function, and you'll be able to you'll be able to query it. Um, I, I don't see it being much more difficult than that. I think the, the hard part is the hard stuff certainly rests on the shoulders of the implementation teams at Elasticsearch and, and in the solar community who have to think about all the crazy stuff like sharding and performance and memory and heap and all that crazy stuff that, you know, users of the tools don't necessarily have to worry about right away. Um, but that's something that is going to also fold into your operations in production of like, well, how much memory do I give the JVM if I'm using dense vector search? Um, how, how should I, what's my sharding strategy going to look like? Uh, is this going to impact, you know, my, uh, my high availability and disaster recovery strategies? You know, is it going to be, is it going to make my index huge and my memory really big? So, you know, I'm going to have to really not worry about my budget. I think those are probably product level questions that are coming come to play. And we'll see when we can actually benchmark um, when, when this technology is available to us uh, in these engines and we can start indexing stuff and, and seeing how to use it. 
What do you think, Dima? I mean, you've tried these things in your blog post uh, series. Uh, do you think once once it's uh, it's going to be easy to use from a practical sense? Um, I like the implementation when it stays inside the GVM, if you're on GVM. Because if you go off here, what, what will happen is that it's so hard to measure like how much memory you should give it. And, and usually these algorithms are super greedy. Actually, uh, for your information, HNSW algorithm is very greedy on RAM. You do have some hyperparameters that you can tune and kind of lower the, the RAM consumption at the expense of like uh, the quality of the index. Um, so that's the indexing trade-off. And then you have the search trade-off where you can also alter some hyperparameters there. So, but, but having said that, I still like the idea of, let's say, if I'm on JVM, give me every tool that's on JVM. I don't want to go off heap, even though it, it sounds sexy to go off heap, but I don't think it's, it's super practical. And again, maybe I will be proven wrong in some time, but for now, I, I would choose this approach versus, you know, let's say open distro, which offers you off heap implementation of HNSW because I've run in, into a number of issues. I don't want to say that I, I'm like um, dissatisfied with open distro. Open distro is a nice, you know, great way of, uh, you know, solving a bunch of issues uh, and also like scaling your system and also Elastic itself, Elastic search, uh, you know, the vanilla one doesn't have uh, any any um, you know algorithm implemented yet, um, uh, but again um, I just well maybe it's just tough luck, but I wasn't able to index one million vectors with Open Distro. It just it just crashed on me really really badly, and I spent multiple days figuring out what's going on. And maybe I just need to give it like a really large machine <laughs> and then just so like throw money at the problem, right? Uh, which I don't want to do. So. Um, Another thing, uh, the practical perspective, and I think Max mentioned that when you will index, you know, when you compute embeddings, don't choose uh, high dimensionality because it, it's it's so it's so appealing to choose like you know 768 dimensions vanilla, you know, uh, uncased BERT, BERT model, and hope for the best. The problem is that the index size will be super huge. If you look at the bare paper and you compare the uh, BM25 to one of the dense uh, dense vectors, uh, d d dense uh, model. The difference was, yeah, it's here. I made I made a note. The difference is that um, the Colbert model is like 900 gigabytes versus 18 gigabytes for BM25. That's like huge difference, like in terms of cost, in terms of memory, in terms of retrieval. And remember Lucene, like it tries its best to cache the fields, but like, will it be working okay for super large segments and super large dictionaries? Probably not. So like, be careful there. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you can always uh, solve problems with uh, more memory, obviously. Um, so uh, we're coming to the end of our time slot here and uh, I want to just just round us off here. Um, I'm afraid we haven't got to everyone's questions in the chat here. We didn't get to everyone's questions from our pre-submitted list, but uh, I do want to thank everybody who submitted a question, and uh, hope you've uh, hope you got yours answered. Um, secondly, uh, huge thanks to both Max and Dima for uh, working so hard on this. We've done quite a lot of work ahead of the ahead of time to make sure we gave you some really quality content here. So thank you both.